Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Praise the Lord, everybody. Why don't we stand to our feet and lift our hands to the Lord and thank Him for His presence tonight. If you love the Lord, let Him know it with your voice. Hallelujah. So thankful for the wonderful presence of the Lord that was here this morning. I felt chains were broken, and there was a deep level of healing that was taking place, a deep level of healing. Sometimes altar calls aren't um, outwardly crazy. People aren't running the aisles, but there's a deep sovereign holiness that comes into the building. And I know that people were changed I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful. And tonight, I want to preach to you a message that God has given to me that represents a principle of liberty, of freedom. So many times people find themselves battling the same thing over and over and over and over again. And this message is for you if you are in that category. I was in that category. And the Lord set me free. You do not have to stay the same way that you came. If you came in here with an issue, a chronic problem, a reoccurring failure in your life, you can be set free. Totally set free. I mean totally. But you've got to want it more than anything. You've got to want it more than anything. You can't worry about who's around you. You can't look, think about what you look like, what you sound like. You have got to want this more than anything. And when you do, the Bible says, in the day you seek me with your whole heart is the day I will be found of you. And some things in God only come when you just give it everything you have. I mean everything you have. I give honor to this precious church family. God bless you all. And brother and sister hires. I, I feel the favor of God upon my life. Today I had roast from sister hires if you have ever been blessed to have her roast you will never be the same again i'm telling you the truth i ate more cow than i should have today i promise you and then she gave us some peach or some kind of mixed berry cobbler with ice cream afterwards I, i'm still dealing with the repercussions of that right now i promise you but it's, uh, it's very special to be here. We love you so much. Brother and sister hires, we love them so much. My wife is, is very sad she couldn't be here today. She's with my family. I forgot hair gel, as you can tell. It's just kind of poofy and frizzy. That's the repercussion of not being with my wife. And um, you just have to deal with certain things, I guess. I don't know. But praise God. Brother Brett encouraged me. He said, it's not how you look. It's what's in your heart. So I was like, okay, I'm all right today. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Genesis chapter 32. Beginning with verse 24. The Bible says, and Jacob was left alone. I have discovered the greatest things you will attain in the spirit come when you are by yourself, it's just you and the Lord. Thank you, all four of you. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, this is the man he wrestled with, he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. The angel said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, 
Jacob. The angel said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob. Slap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, no more Jacob. Come on, slap a few neighbors around and say, no more Jacob. I might have started a few fights here. I'm not sure. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob. Shout those three words back to me. But Israel, for as a prince, hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 6. Prophecy from the book of Malachi, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Can you say those last three words? My people Israel. One more verse of scripture. Isaiah chapter 26 in verse 16. prophet gives us a key revelation in understanding how to be transformed. He said, Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out. Everybody say poured out. A prayer when thy chastening was upon them. I want to preach to you tonight for a few minutes on this topic. Breaking free from your past. Breaking free if you're mere past, tell two or three people around you, tell them you can be totally free. Let's lift our hands to the Lord and ask him to do what he wants to do today. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority of the word of God and by the power of the name Jesus, I loose the gift of faith into this room right now. I pray every eye would see and every ear would hear what thus saith the Lord. I bind every spirit that is contrary to the work of the Lord. And I loose the angels of God in this place right now to carry the word into our souls. Let the word of God have the impact upon us that you want it to have. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands with all of your might and let's shout some praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, everybody shout some praise. Everybody shout praise according to the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Sheila Bahataya. Turn to somebody, give them the greatest compliment you've ever given anyone in your life, and you can be seated. I saw some of you just look at them and laugh and sit down. The Bible is very clear in the Old Testament that... In reference to God, he has been called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These three patriarchs, three generations of covenant patriarchs are singled out as the chosen fathers of the covenant of salvation with God's people. It began with Abraham. The Bible says that God called Abram, as his was name, name was before, out of the Ur of the Chaldees, promised him that wherever he walked, he would give him that land, promised him he would make a great nation of him. And the obstacle that Abram faced was that his wife and he were very elderly. When God called them, they were in their 70s, and by that point, the womb of Sarah was dead and the body of Abraham was incapable of producing, as it said in the New Testament. He was as good as dead. And you see that the Lord brought to pass his word. They had Isaac. He was considered a man of faith, Abraham. He was considered the friend of God. 
Uh, we sing the song, I am a friend of God. Do y'all sing that song? It's one thing to sing it about yourself. It's another thing when the Bible says it about you. And Abraham was referred to as the friend of God. That's a pretty awesome title to have. Abraham was a powerful prophet of God. God came to him before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because he knew Abraham would intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says that the Lord appeared to him in the desert and he came to his tent and sat down and had dinner with Abraham. Has anybody here had dinner with God? That's a pretty awesome thing to say about somebody. And the Lord stayed with him and talked to him face to face. Abraham is in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And we could go on and on about the accolades that should be heaped upon Abraham. But one thing that I don't hear mentioned too often about Abraham was that he was a liar. He was a big fat liar, pants on fire. The Bible says that Abraham was so selfish and self-centered and self-preserving that when he decided to go down to Egypt because of the famine that was in the land that God had promised him instead of trusting in God, he went to Egypt and he said to his 69-year-old wife, he said, baby, you're a fine-looking woman. And when we go to Egypt, Pharaoh is going to try to make you his wife. So what we're going to tell him so we can save me, so I can be protected and they don't kill me, what we're going to tell him is you are my sister. And it's kind of true because we had the same father but a different mother. So we're, in fact, we're half brother, half sister, which is kind of weird. I'm not going to preach about that. but So to preserve himself, he was going to make Sarah lie. A half lie. They went to Egypt, and according to his knowledge, Pharaoh looked at her and he said, mm, That's the finest looking 69 year old I have ever seen in my life. I'm gonna make her a concubine. She's coming in, and the Lord spoke to him and said, Don't touch her, I'll kill you. And Pharaoh said, Abraham, what are you doing? She is your wife. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? And he made some lame excuse, and they kicked him out of Egypt. And from that time forward, Pharaoh disconnected himself from Abraham. Abraham lost his influence in the world at that moment. Another time came where they were leaving the famine, and they went to the Philistines in Gerar. And Abimelech was the king, and he told his wife again, listen, we're going there. They're going to like you. She was some kind of beautiful lady. And he said, when we go there, I want you to tell him you are my sister. Same situation. And he took, him, took Sarah as to come into his house. And the Lord spoke to him and said, you're as good as dead. This man is a prophet. He's going to pray for you and save you. And Abimelech came to Abraham and said, what are you doing? I almost made her my wife. Why didn't you tell me? And he explained to her, well, she is my, it was the lamest excuse you can possibly imagine. The reason why I told you, sir, is because she really is my half sister. <laughs> he was trying to save himself and sacrificed his bride. And his influence in the land of the Philistines was over. You get the next generation, and for all that Abraham walked with the Lord, Isaac did not walk with the Lord. You see four, three or four times that Isaac prayed, but it was basically God coming to Isaac, reminding him, I am the God of your father, and if you will follow me, I will have the same covenant with you that I had with Abraham. But you never see God coming to the tent door of Isaac. You never see God coming and speaking with him face to face as he did his father Abraham. You never see God coming to him to intercede over a dying nation. You never see him coming to him and giving him visions and dreams. It never happens. The spiritual, spirituality that existed in Abraham was diminished in the next generation. And the carnality, the fleshliness, the sin that existed in Abraham increased in the next generation. Isaac, when things got rough, he went to the land of the Philistines. And he told his good-looking wife, Rebecca, he said, baby, 
When we go to Abimelech, he's going to want you for his wife. Let's go ahead and tell him, hmm, what should we say? You know what? It worked for my daddy. Let's tell him you are my sister. That way, if anything happens, it'll happen to you and not me. And now it's not even a half lie. It's a whole lie because Abraham and Rebe- or Isaac and Rebekah are cousins, which is weird. But now the lie has increased. And from that moment forward, Isaac would never have influence among the Philistines again. Then you go to the third generation of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Esau was a hairy, red, woolly mammoth when he was born. And the Bible says that he was a man of the field and a hunter. There was no spirituality in him at all. He had none of the connection, none of the walk with God, none of the consecration. He was an entire reprobate before God. He was able to walk in church and look like church and walk into the world and look like the world. He associated with the Ishmaelites, the Edomites. He associated with, the, with all these Canaanites, and, and he could come back into the tent of his father and look like he was still a part of the church. He was able to be worldly and Christian all at the same time. It was a whole new thing. Jacob was named Jacob. A curse was pronounced over his life the moment he was born. He could have called him anything, but Isaac said, "Mm, I'm going to call this boy deceiver, supplanter, someone who's going to do anything possible to get ahead. Because when Esau came out as the firstborn, Jacob had a hold of his heel. He's like, you ain't getting far ahead of me, buddy. And a curse was pronounced over his life. You see a few chapters later where Isaac is dying. His eyes are growing dim. He's getting blinded from his old age. And he says to Esau, I'm going to pronounce the blessing over you. It's time to give you this blessing. The birthright had already been taken from him by Jacob. Jacob deceived him when he was coming from a hunt. He was famished. Jacob had been making some lentil soup, put some spices in there. Man, he's been boiling. and He knew the trail. The, the game trail that Esau would be walking, and he had it right there, and he was fanning that mist. He was going to get him, and when Esau saw it, he smelled it. Give me some of that porridge, man. My soul is faint. He said, sell me your birthright, and I'll give you some right now. And Esau despised his birthright. The birthright is the responsibility that comes with the blessing. Esau wanted the blessing, but he didn't want the lifestyle that accompanied having, accompanied having that blessing. And so Jacob had already deceived him once, and now Isaac is telling Esau, go make me some stew that I love. Come back. I'll bless you. There's nothing like a good roast that will get that spirit of prophecy going. I'm telling you the truth. I experienced it today in the Holy Ghost. So Rebecca, his wife, overhears the news. The blessing was about to be pronounced. This was not an ordinary day. This was not just a casual moment in the life of this family. This was the moment that impartation, spiritual authority, the covenant blessing would occur. And she went and grabbed Jacob. She said, Jacob, go fetch me a lamb. Go get some skin. Put it on your arms. I'm going to make your father a stew. You're going to go in and get the blessing. And Jacob's like, listen, I've already, I'm already the deceiver. I'm already the supplanter. I've already deceived my brother. When I go into my father, he's going to know it's me, and that blessing will become a curse. He said, shut up, boy, and do what I said. That may be the New Living Translation. I'm not sure. So he goes into his father. His father, his eyes are growing dim. He cannot see. And Jacob has a high, squeaky voice. And Esau has a manly voice. And Jacob said, Father, it's me, Esau. <clears throat> Got a cold. <laughs> and Isaac knew something was up. He couldn't see. He said, well, now wait a minute. I hear something that reminds me of Jacob. Come here, let me feel you. you can you imagine the hair that was on this dude's body? <laughs> to have a sheepskin on your arm? This was a hairy dude. Bigfoot did exist in the Bible right there. So he walks in and he feels his arm. 
And he is convinced in his old age that it is Esau, and he begins to prophesy. You're blessed. Your fields are going to be blessed. You're going to have preeminence over your brethren going out, coming in. You're blessed. You're going you're to carry this anointing. You're going to have the spirit that has been passed down from generation to generation. And once that blessing was pronounced, Jacob got out of there quick because a few minutes later, Esau walks in the door and he said, Daddy, I got your porridge. I got your stew. Give me my blessing. And horror and alarm came into the heart of Isaac. And he said, who are you? He said, because somebody just came in here and took your blessing, and he shall be blessed. And Esau begins to cry. It's amazing to me the horrible timing of some people. Instead of crying when the situation can be remedied beforehand, they always cry when the bad stuff happens afterwards. You can take care of business before it ever happens at an altar. Before that junk ever occurs in your life, you can come up here and cry. That way you never have to cry when you're going through it out there. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? And Esau began to cry. He said, oh, bless me, Father, please. Is there any blessing left? And Isaac began to give a little splurt of a blessing. And at the end, he said, oh, but you're going to serve your brother. And the fury... The anger, the murderous intention of Esau became clear because he said, when the time for mourning for my father is over, I'm going to kill my brother. We'll see who's going to serve who. And Rebecca got the news that Jacob was going to die, and she said, Jacob, get out of here. Go to my brother Laban. You're going to die. And so Jacob packed up everything he had, and he trekked across across the desert, and he was fleeing for his life, and he got real tired, and he he made a place to sleep, and he put some pillows out there made from stones. Can you imagine sleeping on a stone? These were hard people, y'all. I just ordered my pillow from MyPillow.com. Does anybody have a MyPillow? Yeah, they're nice, aren't they? No, they're not nice. We'll change the subject. I love it. I absolutely love it. I have gone through pillow after pillow after pillow, but when I had my pillow, everything became wonderful. It became wonderful. My wife laughs at me. She thinks I'm a, I'm, I'm a freak about it. But anyway, where was I? Stones, yes. He put some stones on the ground, and they became pillows, and... That night he had a dream, and in the dream he saw angels ascending and descending. The heavens opened, and angels were on a great big ladder coming from heaven to earth and ascending and descending. And the power of that dream, the the glory in that dream startled and shocked him so much that when he woke up, he woke up and he said, Surely the Lord was in this place, and I knew it not. And he renamed that place Bethel, which means the house of God. And in that dream, this this is baffling to me because God wanted to continue his covenant with Jacob that he had started with Abraham. And in that dream, he said, listen, I am the God of your father Abraham and the God of your father Isaac, and I want to be your God and continue the covenant with you. And instead of saying, yes, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do, Jacob had the audacity to say, well, If you will follow me wherever I go and bless me and clothe me and feed me and just make me happy all the time, I'll be your boy. I'll do what you want me to do. This is the attitude of some people that come to church and say, what you going to do for me, pastor? You want me to be a part of the Pentecostals of the land? You better come shake my hand and make me real happy every time, every time service is going on. And this was Jacob's mentality. What what am I going to get out of it? If you do this, 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 and this, and this, yeah, I'll be your boy. God was so eager to make a covenant that that was fine. Jacob goes to his uncle Laban and begins to work, and he sees this girl, Rachel, coming to the well and is love smitten, love at first sight. And he is drooling on himself and he's pulling up the sheep, uh, the water for the sheep and he's giving her the schmaz look. 
And he's pulling up the water, and he's feeding. He's like, hey, I'm, and, and the Bible says he fell on her and kissed her, and he, that was the custom. I imagine he put a little extra oomph in that custom right there, and, and he said, where's your daddy? And he went to the daddy, and, and he confessed his love for Rachel, and daddy was thinking, hmm, this is good for me. And he said, you work for me for seven years, and you can have Rachel, boy. And so for seven years, Jacob began to slave at the behest of his, his coming father-in-law, Laban. And, and, and the Bible says he loved Rachel so much that Seven years seemed as a little time to him, just a few days. At the end of seven years, they're preparing the wedding feast that Jacob has got on his tuxedo. And everybody's getting ready, and, and Rachel has on her, her gown, and she's got the flowers out, and they, all the bridegrooms are lined up, and the, and, and the bridesmaids, and they're dancing and singing, and, and the tent's right over there, and they're about to go have their honeymoon, which is 10 feet away from everybody else. Can you imagine? And so at the end of that ceremony, Jacob goes in and a woman comes in and she's totally covered and it's dark and he can't see anything. And, and they're smooching. And the next morning he wakes up and he leans over to say good morning to Rachel and Leah is laying next to him. And Leah did not look like Rachel. The Bible talks about Rachel's beauty, but the thing that it says about Leah was that she was tender eyed. Some translations say she was cross-eyed. Whatever it means, she did not look like Rachel in the eyes of Jacob, okay? I'm not being mean. The Bible was being mean, all right? And Jacob comes to Laban in a fury because the deceiver just got deceived. And he said, hey, what are you doing? You tricked me. The audacity to trick someone you love. And he said, well, it's not fitting to give the older before the younger before the older. If you work for me another seven years, you can have both of them. I'm trying to get rid of both of them anyway. You can have both of them, boy. So now Jacob is married to Leah and Rachel, and that was a disaster from day one. Anytime polygamy is mentioned in the Bible, it is complete disaster, people. They begin to fight with each other because Leah, the Bible says God looked on Leah's affliction because Jacob loved Rachel more. Jacob was just concerned with what she looked like on the outside, and he loved Rachel more. But the Lord loved Leah, and he began to give her son after son after son after son. And Rachel is in a rage, and she's pouting, and she's going into depression, and she wants to end her life. And this is some big soap opera going on and everything's a wreck and in this time Laban's changing Jacob's wages and he's cheating them and his family's falling apart and everybody hates each other he's got four boys but nobody loves Lee and he don't really like her anyway and Rachel's having a hissy fit all day long and finally he's like hey I can my god can I make you have babies woman <laughs> son after son after son and finally Rachel has a boy named Joseph. Y'all know the story. And Jacob loved Joseph more than anybody. He was so whacked out. He was so messed up. He was a horrific father. Absolutely horrible. Had Benjamin. And after Benjamin, of course, Rachel died. I'm getting ahead of the story. But, but Jacob is there. And finally, he's like, I got to get out of here. Laban is cheating me and cheating me. I've got a family. And, and, and Jacob's herdsmen were, were fighting and, and with, with Laban. And, and every, they were too big for each other. And he's, he, he was going to try to get out of there. And, and he took all the, the sheep. God had, had done something to the sheep when they made a deal that all the ugly sheep would be Jacob's. And every sheep that was born from that point forward was ugly. And Jacob got them all, and all the sons of Laban said, that jerk deceived our father. And Jacob tore out in the night, and now he's fleeing because of the deception. And everything that he had when he was with his father, all the mess, no matter where he goes, it seems to follow him. He cannot get into a situation without it ending up in a disaster. Everything he tries, yes, he's blessed. Yes, God is trying to, to reach him, but it all ends up in a disaster. And the Lord says, Jacob, come back to Bethel. Come back to where it all began. Uh, come back to where I appeared to you the first time. Uh, I want to do something for you, but you got to stop doing things on your own uh, and come to where I live. And Jacob went back to Bethel and Esau heard that he was coming. And he gets his big troops together, 450 soldiers together. No doubt with murderous intention. Jacob is trekking through the desert. He hears the news. The messenger comes back. Esau is coming. 
with 450 soldiers. What are we going to do? Alarm spreads through the camp. Everybody becomes afraid. And Jacob says, oh, well, I mean, the main thing is to protect me, right? So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take my concubines. I love them the least. Y'all go to the very front with your kids. Where's my ugly wife? Leah, come here. You're going to be second after the concubines with all your kids. And then my beautiful wife, Rachel, come here, baby. I'm sorry I have to put you in front of me, but you're going to be third with your kids. And I'm going to be last. And maybe Esau will be so tired of killing people that when he gets to me, you read it. It's there. It's actually there. Maybe he'll be so tired of killing people that when Esau finally gets to me, he'll be, he won't do it. And, and everybody go ahead and y'all, y'all take all the flack. Everybody else deal with my problem but me. And so now they're trekking through the desert to meet the fate that Jacob has brought upon himself. And they crossed over a brook called Jabbok. And something came over Jacob. He said, this is going to go on and on and on. I'm going to end up in this position over and over again unless something changes. And he said, everybody else, y'all go ahead. I'm staying right here, and I'm having a prayer meeting. And so the Bible says there wrestled with him a man until the breaking of the day. Later, we understand that this was a theophany or a manifestation of God in angelic form because Jacob said, I have seen God face to face and lived. God came down in angelic form to help Jacob, but all Jacob knew to do was fight because he, instead of receiving God's will, was trying to impose his will upon God. And that is a losing battle. I have seen people come to church year after year after year after year trying to get God to do things their way. And they never receive anything from God. And Jacob is now fighting the very one that was sent to help him. And I, I, I'm not a big man. Obviously, you can tell I'm, a, I'm kind of a skinny like Brett. Did I say that? I didn't mean to say that out loud. My brother is built like a brick house. He's a judo expert. And his name is John. And, and we've wrestled a few times. We were doing this, uh, this boys camp and we were together. And I was going to show these boys. It didn't matter how small you are. It's all about your heart. <laughs> right. And John, the judo expert, he, he, he fell down like I got him, and he was on his back. I'm like, my God, I'm about to whoop this boy in front of all these men. And, and I was on top of him, and somehow he twisted my arm around my own neck and began to choke me out while I was on top of him. It was the most embarrassing moment of my life, okay? And I, I couldn't get the best of him. Never in my life have I ever gotten the best of John in a wrestling match. He's, he's older than I am. I've never had dominion over him, ever, ever. But can you imagine wrestling an angel? They don't have muscles that get tired. They don't have hearts that have to beat more blood to the extremities. They don't have lungs that burn from exertion. They're just pure spirit. And Jacob is wrestling with an angel. And he's so tenacious and so bold and aggressive and stupid in a way. That he's wrestling, and the angel's just like, and Jacob goes into the water. Jacob comes crawling out. Oh, this time you're mine. Grabs the iron leg. Bites that leg, and now the angel's like, get off me. Knocks him back into the water. All night long. And God is getting frustrated because the purpose he came down for is being frustrated by human will. And finally, he said, I'm done with you. I came here to save you. All you want to do is fight. I am finished with you. Let me go, for the day breaketh. The time of your deliverance is over. 
You're going to deal with this junk for the rest of your life. And the realization hit Jacob like a lightning bolt. And he said, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. It dawned upon him, my moment is now, and I've been messing it all up because of my stinking flesh. My human will has been getting in the way. God has been wanting to set me free from myself, and I've been fighting him. No, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the Lord said, get off of me. I'm done with you. And he tried to, he t- the Bible says he touched Jacob in the hollow of his thigh. What that means is the, where the femur joins the hip, all those tendons and muscles and ligaments. God knocked that femur out of joint. That hip became out of joint. The pain must have been excruciating, but it still did not stop Jacob. Sometimes I have seen this happen. Sometimes God has got to break someone's flesh to reach their spirit. I don't want to ever get to that place, people. I want to, I want to be right now. God, whatever you want to do with me, I'm ready right now. Don't, don't touch the hollow of my thigh, okay, Lord? And Still didn't stop Jacob, and he's screaming, don't, don't leave me. Don't leave me in the place you found me. And God finally saw Jacob was in the position that he needed to be in. And so he said, I'm going to go to the root of the problem, the core of the issue. To really get deliverance from God, you're going to have to get real with God. Thank you, whoever said that's right back there, all by yourself. You're going to have to get real with God. Sometimes you're going to have to be very open about the the issue you're dealing with, with God. And God didn't beat around the bush. He went to the core of the problem. He said, what is your name? Ah, my name. It's the biggest embarrassment of my life. When I introduce myself, I have to introduce myself by saying, hey, hey, what's your name, Laban? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm deceiver. Want to do business with me? What's your name? Oh, yeah, my, I'm supplanter. That's what my father named me. It's been a curse that's been following me all my life. I can't escape it. It just comes so naturally to me. And, and God asked him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And God in that moment pronounced three of the greatest words ever written in the Bible. He said, no more Jacob. Man, I'm telling you, if you ever hear those words in your life, I'm going to preach it like y'all are running the aisles and bouncing off the walls right now. If you ever get God to say those words in your life, it will change you forever. No more, Jacob. What did that mean? No more of this battle. You're going to be a different person from this day forward. Every struggle, every battle you've been fighting, every reoccurring symptom, every chronic uh, lie you've believed about yourself, every snare you keep falling into, this curse uh, that has been pronounced over your life. uh, No more Jacob, uh, but Israel. You came in Jacob, uh, but you're leaving Israel. You walked into this water named Jacob, the deceiver, the supplanter, but I'm going to call you Israel for as a prince uh, that has power with God uh, and with men you've prevailed uh, you have prevailed Jacob uh, you have reached your moment of breakthrough the cycle that you have been caught in uh, has now been broken uh, you're not going to deal with this any longer it has been broken uh, the chains that had a hold of you all your life uh, are laying in the water I want you to look at something. God said to Israel, you have power with God and with men. Now, Abraham had power with God, but he lost his power with men because as soon as he faced pressure from the world, he compromised. Lost his power with the world in Pharaoh. Lost his power with the world in in Gerar. Isaac had power with God, but he didn't have power with men. He lost his power because as soon as he faced pressure from the world, he compromised his position compromised his bride but Jacob was different Israel because when he met Pharaoh for the first time after Joseph had rescued the family brought him to Israel Joseph told Jacob he said shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians 
They hate shepherds. And when Pharaoh met Jacob, he said, what is your occupation? That could have been the moment that Jacob said, I'm a prophet. I've sat with kings. I've walked with God. I've seen angels. But instead, the first thing out of his mouth was what he was. He said, we are shepherds. I'm not going to try to hide it from you. I'm not going to deny what God has made me just to get your approval. I am a shepherd. My boys are shepherds. We are all shepherds, like it or lump it. And for the first time in the genealogy of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the king of the greatest empire on earth, knelt before Jacob. And he said, would you get your hands on me and bless me? There was something about this man. He had power with God and with man. Do you realize that that nation over there, in the Middle East is not called Abraham. That nation over there in the Middle East is not called Isaac. That nation over there in the Middle East is called Israel. Why? Because Israel, Jacob, was the only one of the three that made up in his mind, I'm going to break the cycle. I'm not going to carry this legacy of carnality any longer. I'm going to break the cycle. Abraham could have had the 12 tribes. Isaac could have had the 12 tribes. But neither one of them refused to break their flesh. It was this Jacob, this deceiver, this supplanter that I said, I'm going to be different. I'm going to give myself to God. I'm going to break free from my past. And God said, you're going to be the one, boy. I'm going to name my people after. <laughs> Israel comes out of the brook. The brook Jabbok. Jabbok means to pour yourself out. Pour out. Jacob had to empty himself before God could pour into him. Everything Jacob was had to be poured out before God could be poured in. He comes out of that brook as Israel, and he can't even walk the same way now. Everybody's waiting on him. He says, let's go. Let's go meet our fate. They go across the desert. Esau comes. And they're sending gifts ahead of them, trying to appease the wrath of Esau. And he sees this man walking by himself in the desert. He's looking for Jacob. He wants to kill Jacob, but he can't find Jacob. Instead, there's this limping old man that's walking out in the desert, coming closer to him. Every bit of wrath and judgment that was reserved for Jacob died with Jacob. Jacob was no more to be found. And Israel walks up to Esau and instead of wrath, they hug each other and they kiss each other's neck and they give this brotherly love to each other and exchange memories together and, and, and show their devotion to each other. Everything switched in the life of Jacob when he poured himself out. He broke free from his past. I've heard about generational curses all of my life that some people are just bound by a generational curse. Y'all ever heard that stuff? Generational curses. You can see in the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was a me first mentality. Preserve me, save me first, even above my entire family. That was throughout the generations, and it got more and more as the generations increased. And I have seen families where sons and daughters fought the same spirits that their parents had fought and that their grandparents had fought. And I began to look into this, and I found that there is a misunderstanding about what a generational curse is because the devil does not have the power to curse anybody. Some of y'all believe the devil have all power, I guess. I got two amens out of that. The devil does not have the power to curse. He, he is toothless, people. Some people give so much credit to the devil. Man, I tried to get up for church, and the, the wind shut my door in my face and got my finger. The devil was fighting me, pastor. That's why I did. What a bunch of nonsense. I feel sick. It's the devil. I got a headache. It's the devil. My back hurts. It's the devil. You give more credit to the devil than the devil does to himself. You're his greatest fan, man. You ought to say, bless his holy name after you praise him. The devil does not have power to curse anybody. 
only God can bless or curse. Balaam, who was trying to curse the children of Israel, hired by Balak, he went up and the children of Israel were walking across the desert and he lifted his hands to pronounce a curse. And he was paid well and they were getting all ready because whatever Balaam said came to pass and he looked at Israel and he tried to pronounce a curse and he said, they're blessed. And the king said, what are you doing? He said, how can I curse what God has blessed? The king said, hey, come up a little bit higher. Come to this other place. Let's, let's see what you can do over here. I'm going to give you more riches, more glory, more honor. And, and Balaam said, man, I can try it again. And he went up to that second place, and he, and he lifted his hands, and Israel was walking across the desert. And he got real mad, and he's going to curse them good. And he said, they're blessed. I can't do anything but bless them. For when God has blessed somebody, there's no curse that you can pronounce. God is all powerful. There is no curse or device against the blessing of the Lord. So what is it? Why do some people fight the same spirit that their mom and dad fought? The same depression, the same bondage to lust, pornography, drug, alcohol, addiction. They, daddy cheated on his wife and son cheats on his wife. Mommy was depressed and so daughter is depressed. You see that anybody ever seen stuff like this? It's all throughout the world. What is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. It's three little letters. D-N-A. We are a product of our parents. Like it or lump it. Back up and bump it. I'm losing my hair. Thank you, Daddy. I have a weird personality sometimes. I am suspicious of everyone unless I pray. Thank you, Mommy. And some of y'all, you look the way you look. I'm in dangerous territory right now. I know I am. But it's truth. You are the way you are because of DNA, people. You got it from your mommy and your daddy. And Satan has been studying people for millennia. And he knows that if there is a particular opening in the flesh of daddy to alcohol, the flesh of daddy is given to the flesh of the next generation. And so if daddy had an opening in his flesh... To alcohol. That f- opening is passed down to the next generation, and Satan works on the next generation just like he worked on daddy and accesses the same heart just like he did through daddy. He understands DNA. I know of a family where granddaddy abused and beat his wife and left his family, but he had some sons, and one of the sons abused and beat his wife and left his family, and he had sons, and now this third generation, uh, it, it has already been through several wives, very abusive relationships, and alcohol is involved. It's, this, it's the repeating story, the same story, new faces, new names, same story. What is happening? There is a cycle of DNA and unless you make up in your mind I am the one that's going to break the cycle. I am not going to deal with this any longer. This is not going to be my legacy. I'm not going to pass down this weakness to my children. My mom and dad passed it down to me but I'm not passing it down to my kids. You can actually break free from your past. You can break free from your past. What happens when you get the Holy Ghost? Let me tell you what happens. You are regenerated Regenerated. You are regenerated when you get the Holy Ghost. When you were born the first time, your daddy was Adam. Every sin, every failure, every weakness through every generation that Adam began comes to you through the line of the flesh. But when you get born again, God replaces your earthly father for a heavenly father. And you are attached to a new DNA. We are changed through the regeneration of the Holy Ghost. You know where where that word comes from? Before they ever understood genes. That word literally means regened. Your DNA changes. 
You're not dealing with the same stuff you were dealing with. After you get the Holy Ghost, after you get baptized, Pastor Hires was talking about it. That's the name that the whole family of earth is named. Your daddy is replaced by someone perfect. And everything you do to walk with God, when you pray, you are exchanging your earthly mind for his heaven, or your earthly spirit for his heavenly spirit. When you fast, you are exchanging your earthly body for his heavenly body. When you read the Bible, you're exchanging your earthly mind for his heavenly mind. You've got access to a whole new DNA, a whole new set of emotions. You've got access to a whole new list of things in your spirit. If you are willing to pour yourself out and say, I'm done with this cycle, I'm done with this cycle, I'm done with this cycle. I'm not going to deal with this ever again. I'm going to break through my flesh. Woo. Lift your hands. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Just pour yourself out a little bit if you want what I'm talking about. I want you to hear me. I got the Holy Ghost when I was 13 years old. God called me to preach. A youth worker came, put his hand on my back when I was 13. I was at the altar after I had received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Young man came, put his hand on my back, said, Joey, God's going to use you one day. Something exploded in my stomach, in my spirit, in my soul. This reality, this fire was lit in me instantaneously. God is going to use you one day. What, what did he say? God is going to use you. I begin to see visions of myself preaching and ministering and laying hands on sick people, watching them healed and seeing people filled with the Holy Ghost and, and having revival. I begin to see these visions in my head when I would pray. And instantaneously, I'm telling you, right when I got the Holy Ghost, God gave me the gift of diverse kinds of tongues. This is a gift we never talk about. It's like the least of the gifts. It's like the, the, the gift that you get when every other gift has been selected under the Christmas tree. A gift of diverse kinds of tongues. I want miracles. I want healing. I want prophecy. But, oh, oh, there's diverse kinds of tongues over there for some idiot who wants to sound weird all the time, okay? Diverse kinds of tongues simply means various tongues, many tongues. Instead of just speaking in tongues kind of the same way you do all the time, multiple languages come out of you. When you have diverse kinds of tongues, you can speak in tongues instantly. Right? You don't even have to start saying, I love you, Jesus. You can speak in tongues instantly, and it will be God instantly. You can speak in tongues in your head. Oh, we just got in weird territory, didn't we? I'm so sorry. Don't you talk to yourself in your head? Why can't you speak in tongues in your head? I do it all the time. Paul said, when I speak in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, my spirit, my spirit, not the spirit of God, my spirit prayeth. You are in control. And God unlocked that door for me, and I began to speak in tongues. I mean, languages would pour out of me, diverse kinds of tongues. I would pray, and I would think about a country, and that language of the country, the feeling of that would come upon me. And I would, I would start sounding Chinese or Indian or these different chants. And I, I mean to tell you, it was the most incredible thing in my life. I was, I was the young runt out of all the youth group, and I would hang out with all these older kids. They were at the church. After church, we were so crazy, y'all. We would, we would, we, everybody else would go out to eat, and about 20 or 30 of us would stay at the church and stay until the wee hours of the morning. We would pray and pray and pray and speak in tongues and prophesy to each other and lay hands on each other and run the aisles and throw our shoes across the building and throw our ties on the platform and, and, and we would go crazy and we would get drunk in the Holy Ghost. I can remember people speaking in the same exact language in tongues. I can remember them singing songs, the same exact song in tongues. Angels would come into the building. It was absolute apostolic mayhem. And one particular night, we got the idea, man, we are starving. It's like 1130 at night. And the only thing open was Waffle House. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My wife hates Waffle House. It's the one infidelity in our marriage. I have to sneak around and go to Waffle House without her. They've got the best waffles in the world, people. I don't know what they put. I, I think they're putting crack cocaine in them or something because... I might have just lost the spirit. I'm not sure, Brother Hires. I'm not sure what's going on. So we went to Waffle House, about five or ten of us got in the car and went to Waffle House. Now, we were speaking in tongues. We were helping each other out to the car because we were drunk in the Holy Ghost. Anybody been drunk in the Holy Ghost? I'm sorry for the rest of you. If you've never been drunk in the Holy Ghost, that's part of being Pentecostal. You're only partially Pentecostal if you've never been drunk. We say you've received a Pentecostal experience if you speak in tongues. That was only part of the experience on the day of Pentecost. They were drunk. You might as well make up in your mind, I'm going to get drunk. That way you can be fully Pentecostal. So anyway, we were drunk. We were carrying each other. And we went out to the car. Got in the car. Waffle House was five minutes away. We got out of the car in the parking lot of Waffle House. And we're still carrying each other. We go inside, and we're like, this mental uh, uh, transmission occurred. We just all zipped our lips. <laughs> because we knew if we opened our mouth, we we're going to start speaking in tongues again. And so we sat down, and the waitress came over to us, and we were all like. And she said, what would y'all like to order? And the guy closest to her looked at her and said, <laughs> this artist speaking in tongues, man. <laughs> Listen, you're going to go crazy for something. You might as well go crazy for Jesus. I am so sick of people going absolutely bonkers over some dumb ball going across the court or across the field, uh, some stupid sport. They paint themselves. Uh, they act like the fool, and somehow that's all acceptable. But if you go a little bit crazy for Jesus, uh, you're out of line. You're out of order. What a bunch of nonsense. Uh, you can go crazy over Jesus. Uh, you can go crazy over Jesus. Uh, it's okay. Uh, he likes it. I have seen parents, one in particular right now. We just won a, a couple, a whole family. We just won them. My wife is the greatest soul winner I have ever known. She is nuts about soul winning. And I just kind of follow her coattails, and I take all the credit for it. It's a perfect deal, people. It is awesome. We were doing Bible studies with a family. Jessica got an idea to go uh, serve people at her the midwife center where she had the, babe, the lady... I can't even speak right now. Give me one second. Jessica got this idea from the Lord to serve the ladies that have natural birth at the midwife center. My wife had natural birth. She had all her babies at home. She did great. I had to go through therapy afterwards. <laughs> Still recovering. But she understood, you know, when you're at a hospital, they feed you, take care of you for a few days after your birth. But when you have home births or midwife center births, you, you just are fend for yourself. And so she called the lady, Amy Reynolds, the greatest midwife on earth. And she said, listen, I want to start feeding these girls. And, and one in particular, she, she began to feed her Mary Ann and Malcolm. She took them food and, and diff different people in the church got involved. And I'm telling you, in just a few weeks, Mary Ann and Malcolm had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, were baptized in Jesus' name. Their entire family is going to church and they are dancing and shouting and speaking in tongues at the front of the church. They are totally converted to God. Amen. 
But Marianne and Malcolm have had a rough life, and they've done drugs. They've done all kinds of stuff, uh, if I understand correctly. And, and, and their parents seem to have been okay with all of that stuff. But now that they are going to church, their parents are voicing concern that they're getting involved with something that may be dangerous for them. Are you serious? When she was strung out on crack cocaine and walking in the street, you were okay with that and too distracted by your own stinking sin to worry about it. But now that she's lifting her hands and saying, I love you, Jesus, you need to think about what you're doing, girl. You may be involved. What a bunch of nonsense. I can't tell you how excited I am when I see young people crazy about the Lord. I can't tell you how excited I get when I see young ladies preserving themselves for Jesus Christ and young men who are unashamed to dance before the Lord. I'm going to be a fanatic for Jesus. So we're at Waffle House and this lady said, oh, y'all are from Souls Harbor, aren't you? She said, I'll be back. She'd been to our church or whatever. I'll be back when y'all are ready. Finally, we come down enough to order. And after we ate our waffles, we went back outside and spoke in tongues some more. In the parking lot, laying hands on each other. We couldn't care less about anything. It was incredible. At that time, a lady came up to me. I've talked about her before, Sister Sheffield. She came up to me. She said, Joey, God has given you a gift. She said, the devil's going to try to take it from you. You better fight for it. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever, thanks. And this thought started coming into my head. You are making up. Speaking in tongues. Another thought. It's coming out of your head when you speak in tongues. It's not real because it's coming out of your head. The devil is expert at mixing lies with truth. Because the truth is, it does come out of your head when you speak in tongues. Everything that happens to you has to go through your brain first. And these words would come into my mind, and I would just speak the words that came into my mind. Crazy words would come into my head, crazy languages. I would speak them. And the devil convinced me at 14 years old that I was making up the Holy Ghost. I was making up speaking in tongues because it was coming out of my head. And I can remember getting into a devastated position. I was so broken and I began to listen to other people speak in tongues. And, they, and I was speaking in tongues different than they were because I had a gift. They would speak in tongues a certain way, and I sounded different. And I stopped speaking in tongues. And I began to cry and pray and cry and pray and even fast. And I said, God, I'm sorry for faking speaking in tongues. Please give me the real Holy Ghost. And God, when I prayed that way, he put the same impression on me he always did. Just speak what you feel. Just speak it out. It's so simple. Just speak it. And any time I would feel to speak, I would shut that down because I was convinced that is me making it up. There must be some other mystical thing out there that's speaking in tongues and receiving the Holy Ghost that I do not have. And from the time I was 14 until the time I was 21 years old, I did not speak in tongues. Seven years of spiritual famine. And I'm telling you, in that time, there was all kinds of stuff happening in my life and in my family. Things, devastating things began to happen. And I started blaming God for it. I got so bitter at God. And I would listen to other young people that I used to hang out with. They were speaking tongues. I would hate them. because One in particular, I hated his guts. I would follow him everywhere. And I would sneak into prayer meetings where he was praying because he would just sit down and start speaking in tongues and pray for hours. And I would, I would be back there crying and beating my head on the pew. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? How come I can't get over this? What's wrong with me? How come I can't speak in tongues, God? I talked to every preacher. I was that guy that the preachers avoided after church. Every preacher that came to our church, I was waiting in line patiently. And they watched me out the corner of their eye. Oh, God, here he comes again. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Can I have just like 45 minutes of your time? That's it, just 45 minutes. Preacher after preacher after preacher after preacher after preacher after preacher. 
And they would listen to my story, and a look would come into their eye. Oh, well, you just got to speak what you feel. Everybody told me that. Just speak what you feel. Do you hear what I'm saying? I can't speak in tongues. Something's wrong with me. Tell me what it is. Well, listen, you, when you pray, just go pray and, and, and speak what you feel. I got so depressed, people. I'm, t- I'm just being honest with you. I'm not going to tell you all the details, but I became suicidal because I could not break through, and I knew I was going to hell. I would pray before I would go to sleep at night, God, please don't come back tomorrow or while I'm sleeping because I'll go to hell, and you know it. Please don't come back tonight. Let me wake up, and you still not have come back, Lord. That may seem funny to you, but I'm telling you, I was in a pit that I could not get out of. And I remember when I became 21 years old, our our conference was coming around, Touch the Future Conference, and I became so desperate for a breakthrough. I became a complete freak, okay? I mean a freak. You can get to a place that you're so hungry for God and desperate for a breakthrough that you just kind of become a little different than everybody else. And I remember a prayer meeting. I prayed in the prayer room before church. I said, God, I am so desperate to speak in tongues. So this is what I'm going to do tonight, Lord. In the church service, Brother Lee Stone King was preaching that that Friday night of our conference. And you just know the Holy Ghost is going to fall afterwards. And so I said, when everybody's up at the altar, I'm going to lift my hands. And I am going to shout to the top of my lungs, la, 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 la. And I said, Lord, I know that's not speaking in tongues, but that's closer to speaking in tongues than me just speaking English over and over again. Somehow I've got to get out of my routine. Somehow I've got to get out of my flesh, out of this box and mentally that I'm in. So I made this deal with God, and he seemed to be okay with it. So I went into the church, and when the altar call was given, people were running to the front. It was apostolic mayhem. It was absolute insanity. People were running the aisles. They were rolling on the floor. They were baptizing themselves in the water. It was just total, total crate. They were throwing oil. It was nuts. And, and, and I remember going up to the altar, and I felt safe to be a little bit crazy because everybody else was being crazy, okay? And I looked around, and I said, okay, here we go. And I lifted my hands. And I was about to shout, la, 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 and I gave it one more look, and Lee Stone King was looking right at me. Yeah, oh, Jesus, that's right. (laughs) And I did what everybody does. You look at him, and you act like you weren't looking at anything. And I begin to pray over my mind, God, please protect my mind right now. If there's anything in my spirit, in my heart that's wrong, that's offensive, wash me clean, make me, mold me. I give myself totally to you. And I looked again, and he was five feet closer. Five feet closer, ten feet, and I knew he was locked into me. My stomach dropped. My heart started pounding in my chest. He's coming for you, boy. (laughs) And he kind of floated over to me where I was. And he grabbed me. And put his hands on my chest. And he said, Joey, God is about to loose your tongue. And he said, when I say in Jesus' name, boy, I want you to speak whatever you feel to speak in the Holy Ghost. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, the only thing I feel to speak is la, 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 la. (laughs) And I was going to do it safe by myself, but now almost Jesus is standing next to me, and he's going to be watching me and listening to me. So he prayed his prayer, put his hands on my chest, and he finished that prayer with in Jesus' name. And he said, speak it, boy. And I'm telling you, I lifted my hands and lifted my voice. And I said, la! 
And that was the last thing I said that I understood coming out of my mouth. It broke. <laughs> Tongues began to flow out of me. Tears shot out of my eyes. I went forward. I fell forward. I'm telling you, I became so loud and so absolutely insane in that moment because this mighty tidal wave that was being held back by a dam that Satan had built, all of a sudden a crack appeared in that dam, and in just a moment that wall burst forth and water began rushing. Every prayer I had prayed for seven years to be free came rushing out of my mouth and I spoke in tongues and spoke in tongues ah! and spoke in tongues and spoke in tongues. Ah! I was dealing with a strong addiction of sin, suicide. I can't even go down the list with you. I was dealing with all kinds of sin. In that moment, everything was broken. God said to me, no more Joey. <laughs> Lift your voice. Let your voice out for a moment, would you? Just let your voice out, would you please? You have got to make up in your mind. I'm done being me. I'm done living in this box. I'm done with this cycle tonight. I'm breaking the cycle. Tonight is the last night. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. I'm going to let you go in just a second. I'm going to let you do your thing in just a second. But somebody needs a little bit more understanding right now. You are not going to break through casually. I don't know how to emphasize this more to you. You're going to have to get a little bit crazy. I'm telling you, I found out later that my mother had dealt with this her entire life. She did not speak in tongues. I began to pay attention to things I never saw before. My father had dealt with something very similar. My mother's mother, she prayed for five hours a day. Yet Satan had a hold of this part of her mind where she was terrified to speak in tongues for fear it would be fake. This was a stronghold in our flesh. There was something in this logical, analytical mind that Satan knew he had access. It was like a missing puzzle piece. It fit perfectly well to take away the flow of the Spirit. I want to tell you something, people. I prayed so hard to be free. Blood came out of my throat. I pray, I, I screamed, and pr I'm not talking about just some five-minute prayer meeting. I stayed at the altar. When everybody else was gone, I was at the altar screaming, God, 
set me free. I know there's a different life I could be living. Set me free. I'm in a cycle I can't break out of. Set me free. When church was over and everybody started talking, I would make my way to the prayer room and I would pray for another hour. God, set me free. I've got to be different. I've got to be transformed. I pushed aside the plates of food. I started fasting. God, I don't want to live here anymore. I don't want to come to church and be in the presence of freedom and be bound, be in the presence of the Lord. Lord of liberty and be shackled by sin. I can't handle it anymore. I've got to be free. And I want to tell you something. If you're going to be free, you're going to have to stop that little patty cake prayer. I'm not trying to be mean to you, but something's got to get a hold of you, young man. You young men, somebody here is bound by pornography. You can't break free. There's a lady here. You're in a reoccurring relationship of destruction. You keep getting yourself back in it and back in it. You don't know how to get free from it. God wants to break that cycle. There's somebody here, you deal with alcohol, you deal with drug addiction and it was in your family. I'm talking somebody came in with depression. Uh, somebody came in with suicidal thoughts. Uh, it's been in your family for generations uh, and God is saying tonight uh, if you will pour yourself out tonight uh, if you will pour yourself out hey, if you will pour yourself out, uh, if you will pour yourself out uh, God will say no more you no more you no more you. You came in with the name of depression, but you're leaving with the name of joy. You came in with the name of bondage, but you're leaving with the name of liberty. You came in with the name hopeless, but you're leaving with the name victory. You came in with the name of darkness, but you're leaving with the name of light. Break free, break free. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I set you free from all fear, from all apprehension, from all hesitation. I lose. You know why Jesus went to Calvary? Two reasons. First, he was persuaded that his dying would shed blood that was powerful enough to forgive the worst person. You ready? And then he was persuaded that death wasn't powerful enough to hold him. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. You know why we got a church? And I'm persuaded I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If God is persuaded, why don't you get persuaded? Amen. Let's say it again. Ready? The three, the three greatest words in life. Thank you. It's not God is love. It's I am persuaded God loves me. It's not God is able to heal. It's I am persuaded God will heal me. Ah. Uh, We've had such moves of the Holy Ghost here, and yet somehow God has said to my heart, tell these people the greatest thing they'll get out of this whole conference is to walk out of here with an innate persuasion. So, uh, I got a word for you. Some of you got prayed for. Some of you got anointed. Some of you got spit all over. Somebody slapped you around and you didn't get your healing. The Lord told me to tell you, tell my people, sometimes my healing comes as a seed. 
And they want a full harvest. That's a miracle. But miracles are not always given to people. But healing comes as a seed. What does that mean? You better be persuaded the seed can be stolen. You better water it. You better protect it. You better nurture it. You better pray over it. You better bless it. You better encourage it. You better talk to it. You better be persuaded that the miracle is in the seed.